Hello little woman fans. Today we have a triple comment shout out. First one goes to Radical Rin who says, Controversial opinion, I know, but I actually really love Joe and Friedrich and I am a goddamn lesbian. This comment lives in my head, rent free. Another comment shout out goes to Janie Cat 318 I don't care what Tumblr or Greta Gerwig say. It's completely canon that Joe and her professor were crazy in love, got married and had two adorable boys, Rob and Teddy. If Louisa May Alcott really didn't want them together, why didn't she kill him off in the sequel? Instead we got two sequels where they clearly are still madly in love and thriving in the chaos of Plumfield. Here is a quote from the other art blog. I thought the same thing. If she didn't want Joe to be married, she could have killed him off. Plus there are so many scenes where she is clearly attracted to him. They make out and a friend of mine says there is an afterglow scene. Greta light during the whole press tour. When I have read Greta Gerwig's interviews, all these things that she has said about Little Woman, none of them actually happen in the novel. It really has made me wonder, has she even opened the book? She says that she is some sort of an alcohol expert. And then she ignores some very important elements about her, like the fact that Louisa loved Germany. It's not really something you can miss, especially if you study books that Louisa liked to read. She even studied German and traveled there. I'm going to dissect Gerwig's sayings that actually don't happen in the novel. Adaptive attractiveness means that in a film or a TV version, a fictional character who is not written to be conventionally attractive is played by an, an attractive actor. In Little Woman this happens with Joe, with Friedrich and with Laurie. Laurie in the book is written to have brown skin. Yet in all adaptations between 1917 and 2019, he has been played by a white actor. Laurie having brown skin is important because in the plot of the book it plays to the way he sees himself and contributes to his character. I made an episode about it, it's called Laurie and Adaptive Attractiveness. Adaptive attractiveness applies to Joe as well. Joe in the book is not written to be pretty. She is tall and quite muscular. She is tanned and likes to be outside. But in the 19th century that wasn't considered attractive at all. She is very clumsy and socially awkward. Lusa May Alcott sneezed Lulu. She said that her aunt had a very low voice like a man's. That is what Joe looks like in the novel. I've had people leaving not very nice comments to my channel where they complain about the looks of Catherine Hepburn and Sarah Davenport. Catherine played Joe in the 1933 Little Woman and Sarah in the 2018 Little Woman. But I understood these commenters complained that these actresses were not pretty enough to play Joe. Yet these two actresses actually look closest to the book Joe. Let's put a pin on that. Not pretty enough to play Joe, who is not written to be pretty. In Little Woman, Louisa May Alcott criticizes society's obsession with beauty. Catherine Hepburn and Sarah Davenport are tall. They are athletic and muscular. That is what showing the book looks like. If you put the book Laurie and the book Joe next to one another, they are not very balanced. Laurie is effeminate. He is written to have small hands and small feet. Next to Joe, he seems small. It is not just Joe. There are people who complain that Gabriel Byrne Mark Stanley and Paul Lucas, who have all played Friedrich, were not good looking enough. And then there are people who say that Ian Bohen, Gabriel Byrne, Louis Carroll and Rosanna Brassi are too good looking to play Friedrich. All this about a book where the author is criticizing society's obsession with youth and beauty. The most disturbing group of people are the ones who say that the book Friedrich is not handsome enough for Jo, despite the fact that Jo is not written to be particularly beautiful herself. And one of the main themes of the novel is that love beautifies a person. Louisa May Alcott was taller than most men. She also liked to run and she exercised. In the 19th century, the average length of woman was a bit shorter than now. So you can imagine that Louisa stood out. In the novel, Jo feels herself as a freak and as an outsider. There is criticism towards Meg and Amy because they wish to fit into the female circles. Movies have been criticized because they put the spotlight on Jo and don't focus that much on other sisters. But lately there has been more discussion how Jo or Louisa demonizes sisters' femininity. In the 19th century, the world between men and women was strictly divided. One of the reasons why Jo prefers the male company is because there is less criticism about her looks, at least not in front of her. 
She feels quite insecure about her body and often compares herself to Amy and Meg. They are treated better in the society because they look more feminine. Meg is written to be the most beautiful of the sisters. Amy is not that beautiful, but she is poised and she has nice manners. But Jo has quick tongue and she can control her mood changes. Let's start with this quote from Gerwig saying that she hired a hot bear, that Jo would feel herself like a winner. Because, quote, how could she say no to someone as handsome as Timothy Chalamet? Jo in the book is never attracted to Laurie. Laurie is described to look very effeminate, and there are times when Jo even refers him as girly or daughter. Sorry, Ronan and Timothy, they are Gerwig's golden duel. If she makes a film where the two are, her fans and their fans are going to see it, and many of them have not read Little Woman and never read it. I didn't follow the press tour of the 2019 film, but Little Woman fan Jimena did, and this is what she says. You know, the funny thing is that it does seem to me that Sarah and Timothy are in a situation pretty much like Joe and Laurie in the book, where Sarah can't make clearer that they are just friends and Timothy keeps pushing. I mean, I watched the whole press tour and there were a couple of times where he said that they have the same relationship as Joe and Laurie, only he hasn't declared his love. And at one time, Florence added, yet. And a few times, Sawyers has been pushed to admit feelings for Timothy and she keeps saying, they are just friends. Ima Greta, in an interview for Vogue, they asked her if she was trying to set them up and she was like, sure, why not? It is a similar thing to what happens to Joe. How could she not want that handsome man? Based on this, it sounds like this film didn't have nothing to do with Little Woman and more to do with the actors and the director shipping them. There are also fans who romantically ship the two actors and the characters that they play. Cho criticizes Laurie in the book because Laurie is quite materialistic, very different to Friedrich who is always willing to give away from the little that he has. I made an episode about it called Why Friedrich is Poor. For Louisa it was important that partners in a relationship shared the same work morals, which is what Cho and Friedrich do. And Cho also criticizes that Laurie doesn't care about school and he doesn't like to work. Cho loves school, she wants to go to university. She also admires Friedrich because he is hardworking and they have similar views about education. These elements of Joe's and Laurie's differences and Joe's and Friedrich's similar interests are not in Gerwig's film. The entire Tim Bear vs. Tim Laurie debate that Little Woman is known for, it is entirely manufactured by filmmakers. 1994 film has been accused of romanticizing Joe and Laurie, but Gerwig's Little Woman is accused for the very same thing. Same has been said about June Allison and Peter Lawford in the 1949 film. The list goes on and on. In the novel, the whole reason why Joe travels to New York is because she doesn't want to be alone with Laurie because he is harassing her. Not only trying to push her into a relationship, but a physical connection that she does not want, at least not with him. If we would actually see Laurie harassing Joe in the films, do you think we would have this entire debate? Here is another quote from Jimena. I read the book expecting and even looking for some romantic elements in Laurie and Joe's scenes, but there was none. In the first book they are best friends and nothing more. It's until the second book that everyone notices Laurie's advances, but Joe asks them not to talk about it because it makes her super uncomfortable. Every time he tries, he hits a wall. Seriously, how did he reach to the conclusion that a proposal was appropriate? Did he even have a ring? Greta portrays Laurie just as the character would have portrayed himself, as the martyr who loved a girl who never loved him back. Laurie is not a martyr. People shouldn't pity him. He ignored Joe's signals once and again. He tried to force her to accept and even threatened to hurt himself. That is so toxic. But Greta Gerwig does. There is this one group who she says that Joe and Laurie belong together. Then another group who she tells that Joe is gay. And third group who she says that Jo is asexual and never wants to leave her home. And the only thing in common with these groups are her anti friedrich statements and racist propaganda of him being German. Here is a quote from blogger My Fan Fiction Garden. Gerwig telling one group of people one thing and another something else is the worst thing ever. It is like she's selling herself for money, always changing her opinion. I would also blame the producer or studio for letting her on the loose. 
I never understood why one should label something for modern audiences instead of being honest to the past and making Friedrich, quote, hot because shallow reasons is anything but right. Too many radical feminists have a, well, let's say, a limited understanding of human nature and the world. It is wrong to rewrite history to fit your needs. Luisa had been in love with both Taro and Emerson. One shouldn't ignore that. She loved everything German, so saying otherwise is lying. When I started to read Henry Thoreau biographies, there was something that made me 100% convinced that Henry was the real-life Friedrich. It seemed that everyone in Concord had some kind of opinion how Henry looked like. The woman who fancied him thought he was handsome. The people who considered him more as an eccentric member of the town thought he looked funny. Some of his friends said that he looked a bit odd when they first met him, but when they got to know him, he started to seem very pleasant. When Friedrich Schiller met Goethe, and Goethe was another model for Friedrich. Schiller wrote that he was a bit disappointed that he didn't look as handsome as he had imagined, but Goethe was such a nice man to be with that he soon forgot his disappointment. In the book when Joe meets Friedrich for the first time, she does find him attractive. She even positions herself in the nursery so she can stare at him all day long, but the more time she spends with him, in her eyes he becomes more handsome, and Friedrich sees Joe the same way. All romantic interests in Luce's novels are based on Henry Thoreau in some level. All of them. They have blue eyes, sometimes they have beards, they are tall, they have big hands, big feet, they are solidly built, and they have broad shoulders. Many of these romantic interests also speak with German accents. There is a theory that Louisa May Alcott may have suffered from high-level testosterone production, also known as PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. All people need testosterone, but with women, high level of testosterone can create physical symptoms. Body appears more muscular than feminine, voice becomes a lot lower, and it can create aggression and mood changes. Louisa has been described with all these symptoms. After her service in the war, Louisa became sick with scarlet fever, and she was treated with mercury, and the mercury treatment was continued through the rest of her life, and it messed up her hormonal balance even more. You would find Henry reading Plato and wondering about the relationship between man and nature. He never seemed to care how he looked, with his white hair, shabby clothes and scuffed boots. He liked to eat with his fingers. For the smitten Louisa May Alcott, Thoreau's eccentric surface was part of his charm. As she later wrote, beneath the defects the master's eye saw the grand lines that were to serve as the model for the perfect man. Louisa wrote about this into little woman. Is the scene where Jo begins to describe Friedrich in her letters. Cast away at the very bottom of the table was the professor, shouting answers to the questions of a very inquisitive, deaf old gentleman on one side, and talking philosophy with a Frenchman on the other. If Amy had been there, she'd have turned her back on him forever, because, sad to relate, he had a great appetite, and shoveled his dinner in a manner which would have horrified, quote, her ladyship, I didn't mind, for I like to see folks eat with relish, as Hannah says. And the poor man must have needed a deal of food after teaching idiots all day. When I was younger, I struggled to understand this scene, which probably means that I was a lot more like Amy than I like to admit. But this is actually a really good way to see that the things that Louisa found attractive, they were not things that most people would pay attention she even mentions how Amy would turn her head away, but she won't. Jo likes that Friedrich is unconventional, and in a way that unconventionality of her and him is something that bounds them. In Jo's post, there is a scene where Jo has gained weight, and Friedrich tells her that in his eyes, she is still the most beautiful woman in the world. Mercury treatment and the high testosterone could also make a person to gain weight. Reda Gervik called Friedrich stuffy. Once again, zero mentions of Joe's looks. In the novel, Friedrich is written to be a bit stout, and that it's something that Joe actually finds quite attractive. And pretty much all of Louis's literal heroes are a bit stout. And there is criticism about skinny guys, that Louis's sister may like skinny guys, and Louisa liked dad butts. What is so difficult about this for people to understand? I have mentioned this before, but here we go again. A Joe worshipper comes to meet Joe, and then she sees her portrait, and Ted, who is Joe's and Friedrich's son, says that it is a portrait of his mother. 
and this fan is horrified and doesn't want to meet her since she thinks that Mrs. Bear is a goddamn ugly. All based on Lucy's own experiences with Joe worshippers who were always disappointed when they saw her because they imagined that she would look pretty like Joe. But Joe is not fitting to be pretty in the book. Looking the way Lucy looked like, it wasn't easy to find love. Or somebody would say that she was the most beautiful woman in the world. To my experience, there are two types of Alcott schoolers. The Alcott schoolers who make the connection between Lucy's love life and Joe's love life. Then there are Alcott schoolers who don't make the connection and also ignore Lucy's love life. And their arguments for hating Friedrich's character, which often is the case, is that they don't think he's handsome. Which is very superficial, since there is no such thing as universal standard for beauty. This is a quote from Claire Bender's essay, Gender Stereotyping Little Woman. Geraldine Brooks declares, Another reason Alcott crafted the direction of Joe's life in this way was because she seemed to want to marry but never did. It seems likely, however, that she did have at least two different love interests in her life. Perhaps Alcott decided to give Joe what she herself always wanted, marriage and a family. Alcott got the last laugh by marrying her to an unromantic character. In this case, the schooler mentions that Louis actually had two love interests, but they refused to make the connection between Louis's love life and Little Woman, despite the fact that Little Woman is a semi-biographical novel. Once again, the reasoning for Louis not wanting to marry is, quote, explained her marrying Joe to an non-romantic character. But they don't stop and consider the fact that what Louis and Mayalcott saw as romantic is also romantic for Joe. For those of you who don't know, Geraldine Brooks wrote a book called March, a fictional book about Joe's father, and she is absolutely right. Lucy did want to get married and have children, and it seems that she wanted all that with Henry, so why Lucy didn't marry? Henry passed away when Lucy was 28 and he was 44. In Little Woman, Joe and Friedrich marry when Joe is 28, and Friedrich is 44. Even after Henry had passed away, Lucy never gave up hope. She writes about the men she meets in her journals. Louisa wanted to marry for love, but in those times most people married for money. Louisa's sister May had also written to her journal how difficult it was for her to find a partner who would allow them to work outside home. Garrick said that Laurie is Joe's first feminist ally, and that Laurie wants Joe to step into the adult world. When I got into this point of this interview, I was like, what is this imaginary book that Garrick has read since none of that happens in the actual novel? When Laurie proposes Joe, he says that once they marry, she doesn't need to write and she has more important things to do, like to take care of him. He is a man-child. If anything, Joe is the adult in that relationship and she is frustrated that he is behaving like a young boy even in his early twenties. The person who saves Laurie is Amy because she inspires him to better himself, but that's not in this film or any other films. Here's a quote from Little Woman fan, Hetherfield. Gerby clearly found a different version of the book than the one we read. It is important to consider these books in the context of the period and culture they were written, and unfortunately, it is something that is often forgotten in the adaptations. But how can you understand a story and a character if you don't know the cultural and societal reasons that motivate them? I really hate when people say, Jo should have stayed single and enjoyed her life in New York like they are thinking about Carrie Bradshaw in Sex and the City and don't think or don't know about the weight that being a spinster was for a woman in the 19th century, psychologically and economically. In 1870s, Louise was making $2 million a year with her children's books, which is a lot of money. What I checked, that is about $21 million today. She was filthy rich, yet in her journals, she never seems to be fully content or happy. Her poor health wasn't cured, and the money would not bring Henry back. Nobody likes to admit that they are lonely. Louisa's letter to her friend Maggie Lukens are probably the ones where Louisa is most honest about herself and her feelings. She writes about her belief for reincarnation and receiving her, quote, award in the next life. Louisa May Alcott, the children's friend, presented Louisa, minus the rough edges, as the genteel spinster Aunt Jo. Louis and her publisher, Thomas Niles, invented the image and built Louisa into a brand. Alcott schooler Daniel Shirley has echoed this style of branding, saying that it was a way to keep 
Louis' public image pure. Edna Cheney, who wrote the first Louis and May Alcott biographies, also did this by cutting away stories from Louis' relationships. For 50 years, Cheney's biography was the only biography available about Louisa, and it shaped the future generation's views about her. In the 19th century, reputation was everything for a woman. 